Welcome to the Fantasy Source Football Podcast. My name is David A. Arnott, sitting here with Brad Pinkerton and Sean Merriman. Why do I say sitting here every single week when we're actually standing? Let's let's draw the picture for everyone. We're in the sporting news studio. We got lights on. We got big mites in front of us talking about fantasy football. And this week, uh, we are reaching the halfway point of the season. Brad, the second half outlook for players that had a terrible first half. I mean, there have got to be some fantasy owners. We've talked about this. Sean talked about this early in the season. Chris Johnson, I mean, at this point, Javon Ringer is ta- is actually taking carries away from him. Yeah, it's, it's sad what's going on with Johnson. And, you know, you can point to so many different reasons of maybe why he's floundering so far this season and, you know, still maybe find some optimism uh, for, for him to turn around. But really, you saw Ringer, and he looked he looked good. Not great, but he looked good last week in relief of Johnson. Meanwhile, Johnson just looked bad. I mean, he looked like he was actually trending downward even more. So, you know, it, it's tough to be optim- optimistic. And uh, I made a move to trade for Johnson um, on a team that I had that was sinking to the bottom of the standings already. So I swung for the fences, and so far it's been a huge whiff. I mean, one of the things that I talked about sometimes with other people and friends is uh, fantasy football arbitrage, where, you know, at, at this point in the season – You've got to take a huge chance on guys that other people are going to start undervaluing. Uh, Sean, do you see Chris Johnson as the type of guy that should be undervalued at this point? Or are you saying, you know what, lay him by the wayside, trade him if you can? Well, the thing is that the person that Brad is talking about who he made the trade with was actually myself. So we've been talking about that back and forth. And, uh, you know, I had a deal where I sold him low compared to where I drafted him but uh it's it's funny that it worked out that way because I got Darren McFadden in return who's also hurt so uh the way I see it with Chris Johnson is you know I think that owners kind of thought all right he's been slow this might be the week he had that matchup against Indy this week a weak run defense a weak team in general and you just didn't see it you saw Javon Ringer come in and Ringer's one of those guys that I know we kind of have those discussions amongst our uh, amongst our newsroom. Who's that one guy that if he just gets his chance, you think he'd be a breakout player? And Ringer's always been that kind of guy. I mean, with that's me. the Tashar <laughs> Choice Memorial Award. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and Ringer's kind of always been that guy, even though he's young. So you know, I still think that CJ will be the starter. I still think that CJ will see his carries, but don't be surprised to see Ringer a little more worked in now. I mean, a guy, I love that phrase there, he's still going to get his opportunities, he's still going to get his carries. You can you can make that same sort of argument with the next guy on my list here, Reggie Wayne. He's still going to get the targets, he's still going to get opportunities, he's still the Colts' number one receiver. He got targeted 14 times, according to Fantasy Source stats this past week, and had five receptions. And that seems to be a trend ever since the Curtis Painter era started. Uh, Sean, how do you see Reggie Wayne's season going the rest of the way? Is it going to be more of the same? It, do you feel like he may as well just give up and wait for next year and not get hurt? It almost seems that way because if you think about what the situation Reggie Wayne is in, he's had it for so good for so long <laughs> that this is just one of those things where he just wakes up one day and he just wonders, what the heck has gone wrong? I mean, the man hasn't even had to line up on the other side of the field his entire career. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly, because he has one of the best quarterbacks of all time throwing to him. So, you know, I think that what we're seeing from Reggie Wayne right now is about what we're going to expect. And if we see anything more than six catches for 65 yards, it's considered a good day. Brad, I see you nodding your head. I mean, where would you place Reggie Wayne in the pantheon of receivers, fantasy receivers at the moment, because he's 27th among receivers in fantasy points so far. Does that sound about right? Do you think he's going to get better, maybe even fall even further? Yeah, I'm, I'm sticking with my stance from an earlier podcast we had talking about the Colts situation with Curtis Painter. And, um, you know, what we've seen from Reggie Wayne is about what you can expect for the rest of the year, just like Sean said. So, uh, you know, I'm not expecting him to turn anything around. He is, he is still super talented, even though he's getting up there in years. Um, and he can make the best of a bad situation, but... Unfortunately, making the best of Curtis Painter means probably wide receiver three status at best. Now, let's shift topics a little bit here, or rather shift gears, and talk about the guys who have exceeded expectations in the first half. Guy that is probably very near and dear to your heart as a Carolina Panthers fan, Cam Newton has come out of nowhere. And in many ways, this I mean, there is a little bit of me that thinks, okay, maybe his fantasy value, second among all quarterbacks according to the fantasy source stats, is a little bit inflated compared to his real life value, but 
you know what? It doesn't matter if you've got a rookie quarterback that's almost inarguably a top 10 quarterback already in the league. And as a fantasy performer, Guy is the, is the Panthers' red zone running back. I mean, where do, do you see him continuing this, or are teams going to eventually adjust? Well, they can, can ad- they adjust? Can they adjust? They can adjust all they want, but when you know a quarterback that big is running and juking your secondary and linemen and everybody else, then there's not much you can do. But I think the knock on Cam was always his accuracy, uh, and we've seen that pop up, that problem pop up uh, quite a bit, even even after those 400 yard games to open his career. Um, but what's always going to be there are the rushing yards, and that's what's padding his fantasy stats. So. From a fantasy owner's perspective, it doesn't matter if those uh, passing yards start to dip a little bit in the second half. Those rushing yards are going to be there. He's still, like you said, the goal line back, uh, per se, for the for the Panthers. So um, I'm thinking top five quarterback value for the rest of the year. Sean, are you, are you on board with top five quarterback, fantasy quarterback for Cam Newton? I am, definitely. Um, I'm looking at it from a fantasy standpoint and a team standpoint where Carolina's struggling. They're not winning those close games. And if you think about it, you know, what is the coach going to do to change that? Well, there's nothing really he can do other than get the ball into his best playmaker's hands, and that's clearly Cam Newton. So I think that Cam's going to continue to throw for big yards and run for big yards, and therefore, yeah, I suppose that's top five status. Now, guy who has has been a top five running back this year, I'm still waiting for Fred Jackson to fall off of a cliff. I mean, like, I, I call me a hater, whatever you want. I'm waiting for him and Ryan Fitzpatrick, and for that matter, Chan Gailey and his entire offense to basically just do what I expected them to do before the season began. I mean, it's one of those things where no matter what the evidence is there and, like, my rational brain says, you know what, they're actually pretty good. They've, they've put it all together. They seem to have everything clicking. It just doesn't make sense to me that Fred Jackson – would be doing so well. So, Sean, do you have do you have anything like that? Am I just talking crazy talk? I don't know. Where do you see him? What do you see him doing the rest of the year? Well, put it this way: I don't think that Fred Jackson's going to finish up the number one fantasy running back, which he is right now. But I do think he is going to finish and say the top eight. Um, they're a team that you know a lot of people can look at and say, "Well, what's their weakness? What can we stop? What can we stop? Can we stack eight in the box to stop him?" Well, no, you probably can't because Fitzpatrick's having a great year with Stevie Johnson. And even we saw his tight end Chandler coming on. So this is an offense that's surprising a lot of people, and I think that only helps Jackson's value. Um, I don't think that he's going to continue to have the amazing, consistent bat, you know, multi-touchdown games, but I certainly don't think that his you know, status is going to dip that much. He'll still be a top-10 back for sure. Brad, I'm going to do a, a John McLaughlin impression really here. Uh, Chan Daly, the Nets Mike Martz. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Um, you know, looking at Jackson, like, it's, it's just very surprising. And I'm going to contradict myself here. Um, his performance on the field definitely matches the box score. And I'm buying into it. You watch him run. He, I mean, he runs with a purpose. He's fast, he's shifty, and he gets the job done. And I feel like he's going to continue doing that. But I would not trade for him in a fantasy league because of what you would have to give up to get him. You're probably giving up someone who should be doing that to this point, if not even better. So he's an interesting case where he'd be very tough to convince me to to buy into. So you're basically saying if you have him, just ride him. And if you don't have him, you still have to think, okay, in the back of your mind, there's a high variance between what he could be doing and what he could be, you know, how badly he could be doing. Absolutely. All right, well... We're going to be taking a break really quickly, and when we get back, we're going to talk about the guys who have emerged in the past week or two that you might be looking at picking up. So the first guy we're going to be talking about, we've already mentioned in this podcast, Javon Ringer. Now, Brad, you said he looked he looked good. I mean, 14 carries, 60 yards, not terrible by any means at all. Uh, what are you expecting if you pick him up uh, this week, and why would he be a more attractive pickup than any other, any of the other running backs or even wide receivers that are out there? Well, we see those stats that you mentioned coming out of the Titans' backfield for the first time all season. I mean, we get really excited, and we start to think, well, maybe this is the guy. Maybe he's going to break out. But the fact is, Chris Johnson's still getting paid a lot of money. Um, he's going to get he's going to get the benefit of the doubt. He's going to get the most carries possibly or at least the early carries in the game and Titans are going to ride the hot hand now that could end up being ringer he could get the late game carries so it's going to be tough guessing which running back is going to be the the most productive from week to week so it's going to be tough guessing which to start Um, but ringer is a guy you want to pick up just in case because 
the momentum right now is definitely shifting in his favor. And if I had to bet on anyone to finish up stronger, it's going to be Ringer right now. Yeah, Sean, if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking to yourself, oh, my goodness, I need a running back. Well, clearly you missed out on the DeMarco Murray sweepstakes. Mm -hmm. Ringer, anything like that? Or is there? does he have that kind of uh, ceiling? What do you see from him? Got him. Got him on draft day. Oh, Stored on the bench <laughs> uh, for this very reason. Well, yes, he's probably a handcuff in plenty of leagues. <laughs> right. Um, but if he is still on the waivers, no, I would suggest going and getting him. Would I put him in my lineup every day? No, not necessarily. But I think that the deal with Ringer is that you look at when they te- play a team like the Colts, uh, when they have a favorable matchup, you're going to see them run the ball out because they'll be ahead, and that's when Ringer will really shine when they're in those situations. So it, so any chance he turns into something like the poor man's Jonathan Stewart, where he's probably clearly the second running back, or at least the Jonathan Stewart of the past few years, where he's the second running back but still produces? It's certainly possible. Uh, say De- Not to go De- out on a limb and We say, could yeah. compare <laughs> Chris Johnson to D'Angelo Williams as well. So oh, There you go. Oh. <laughs> uh, then there were some receivers that jumped out. This seems to happen every year in fantasy that a receiver will have a great day. Maybe somebody who everyone expected to be talented, but you know didn't really do that great a job up until this point. Now all of a sudden things okay. Now they're going to get their their chances. John Baldwin of the of the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, yeah, the Chiefs won because Philip Rivers fumbled a ball. I would say we're about to kneel essentially. But Baldwin had himself a pretty good game. Sean, do you think that he's worth a pickup at this point uh, over, say, like if, you've, if you're like my team, I've got Devon Best who's just sitting there at my third receiver slot. Would you, play, would you go after Baldwin and hope to try to play matchups with him? Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, the pun on words for Jonathan Baldwin is that he got some sense knocked into him literally by <laughs> Thomas Jones. So, um I think that he's a, you know, he's a borderline, he's a bench player right now. If you if you are weak at receiver and you need to fill your bench with some depth there, I think that he's a solid pickup. Um, you know, Bo's still the guy there. That's not an offense that you're going to see consistently throw for 300-plus yards on the regular, um, especially with Jackie Battle coming on, you know, as a decent play and then being able to establish the run a little more. So I think that I view Jonathan Baldwin right now as a guy, a nice pickup, keep some insurance on your bench, and if you have one of these last couple buys coming up or an injury, you can go ahead and plug him in. Brad, are you on board with that? Yeah, I would also. I'd call him a high upside pickup, not someone that I'm going to grab this week and then immediately plug in the starting lineup. But, you know, at 6'4", 230, and he's a leaper, and we saw that when he grabbed that touchdown pass over the defender in the end zone. Um, the Chiefs know what they've got, and they're going to find a way to exploit it. Um, they don't really have a tight end threat, and he brings a big body. They put him in the slot, and it worked last night. We can see that more. Um, Breston's going to steal quite a bit you know, as a number two receiver, at least for now the Chiefs' true number two receiver. Um, but Baldwin could leapfrog him easily. We could forget about Breston in a few weeks. I like even what though, you did there. He could leapfrog him. Even, even though, even <laughs> though he's, uh, Breston has had some pretty good games himself, um, you know, it's, it's not out of, the, out of the question to think that there could be three viable fantasy options in, in Cincinnati, or, uh, Kansas City. Now, thinking about leapfrogging and having three viable fantasy options, the Pittsburgh Steelers seem to have changed their offensive philosophy over the course of this season, and especially against a weak pass secondary, a weak secondary like against New England's when Ben Roethlisberger was just throwing all over the place. Now, all of a sudden, in addition to Mike Wallace, they've got Antonio Brown, who's been doing pretty well all season, and Emmanuel Sanders. So how do you see that after Wallace? How do you see those other receivers breaking down, especially considering that Heinz Ward is pretty much out of the picture now? Well, well, let's start with Wallace and what he did this past week to kind of give an idea of what the Steelers are going to be doing because he had seven catches for 70 yards. Now, normally, Wallace, if he has seven catches, you're expecting about 200 yards with his big playability. But um, the, the Steelers are scaling it back. Instead of just chucking the ball deep, they're looking for short, quick routes to get the ball out of Ben's hands a little quicker, keep him healthy and upright, um, and it worked. This I past mean, week, at least. And, you know, it might also be a, re- a reaction to the Richard Mendenhall's ineffectiveness, too. True. That's that's part of it. Um, so those all go hand in hand. Now enter Antonio Brown, who's had he's had a great season to this point already. And Emmanuel Sanders steps in for Heinz Ward, who would normally be filling this short pass, quick over the middle kind of route, um, that role. Um, I think the Steelers now have three very explosive options at receiver that aren't necessarily always going to be downfield, boomer bust um, threats. So... Really, these guys are going to be involved quite a bit, and it's, we're going to have to wait to see how Ward's return affects, especially Sanders, but also Antonio Brown, and then they have four receivers on the field. But I think right now it's worth a speculative grab for Sanders and definitely Brown. Sean, we know that Wallace is ahead of all the other guys in the receiving core, but how do you rank uh, Sanders and Brown among all the wide receivers? 
right now I'm thinking that Antonio Brown is a guy that, you know, on draft day he was kind of a late, late round steal, maybe left on some waivers. Most people are beginning to follow the trend to pick him up now. I played him as a wide receiver three this past week, and I was pleased with him, and I think that he's slowly working his way into that category as a wide receiver three, uh, especially if Pittsburgh sticks with the uh, the game plan that Brad's talking about, that it seems that they that they are. And with Sanders, um, I would put Brown a step above of him. I would probably keep Sanders on my bench, but both should certainly be rostered right now. Guys, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thanks.